And most of the people on the call are coaches or build a coaching practice on the side as we have someone here. And we thought it would be great to have you here answering the questions that people have. As everyone is in their own journey, in their own process, we looked at some principles. We looked at words of service, building a practice in an ethical way, like being in alignment with yourself while you do it, what it looks like to actually serve people. And people had amazing questions that I sent to you today, where we help, we can get into most of them too. And what I wanted to do before we get into them is just share about who you are for me and start us off this way. So I met Ankush three years ago, I think it's already over Facebook Messenger. And I met you after I've watched plenty of the videos I found that you had made with several different people. You did some interviews at the time, but you've also been interviewed. And it was one reason why I reached out to you. And that was really you shared very openly about the journey of becoming a coach, your journey of the three principles, which at the time were really attractive to me. But you shared also a lot about the learnings you had made growing your practice from basically basically zero to what is now a very successful business. And I, um, as far as I know, uh, you're, I think probably the point zero point five percent of coaches earning the amount that you earn and also working in the capacity and in the way of impact that you do. So I consider you one of the best coaches on the planet. You live the distinctions you teach, the distinctions of service, of loving people, of really caring about people, but also how to run a business and the business of coaching. And I found that being so present in how I met you and how you then at the time you referred me to somebody else who was an amazing coach, coached me. And every time we had interactions, I learned from the way you interacted with me about how I could show up as a coach. And that's been leading into me doing the school last year and signing up with you as, as an apprentice. And we're now working together in a continuous fashion. And apart from the lightheartedness that I experienced with you, there's so much I learned about running a coaching business creating groups, creating programs. And I would say there's an element of your dedication to excellence in what you do that I not often find because it doesn't come out of, oh, I need to be perfect before I can do anything. So I feel good about it, but it comes out of a dedication to the industry and to really what you want to represent coaching is. And I find you being a very inspirational stand for the industry. And I'm very, very glad you said yes to joining us today and, and sharing your wisdom with us. So thank you so much Ankush, for being here today. Well, you're welcome. And thank you so much for the, the wonderful introduction. It's really an honor to be here. I know some faces, obviously, Felipe and I work uh, closely together. Rani, I know well, and Shai, I met in India. I don't know if I've met anyone else here before, but you know, I have only seen great things being posted on social media about this program. And so I know you're doing a wonderful job. And absolutely, I, I there's no way I could say no to, you know, what you're putting out in the world and, and how you're making this community and the work that you do so much better through everything you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ankush. I really appreciate that. The first one I reached out to you, we, we talked about you talking about building a business through love. Yeah, so many people had so many great questions that I think in a way lead into that topic beautifully. So as we talked about before the call, I just gonna go at you with some questions. So Ankush, I had a great curiosity because you're working with so many coaches in various stages of their coaching practice and building a practice. And I would be interested, and I think it could be interesting for everyone in the group to hear from you what you found in working with coaches are the qualities you see oftentimes in the people that succeed in building their practice and becoming prosperous and having a sustainable business and the qualities that you see getting in the way of people growing their practice as you work with so many by now? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. The facetious side of me would say the quality I see in people who succeed are that they hire me. And that's only slightly tongue in cheek. I think hiring a coach is, I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. You guys have all probably heard this, but it really makes 
such a big difference. So I started coaching in 2012. And for the first couple of years, I was in a group program. I mean, I paid thousands of pounds to be in these group programs with, with Jamie Smart. And I convinced myself that because I was in this group training, that was the same as hiring a one-on-one -on -one coach. And so I remember like a year in, I, I got onto Steve Chandler's email list and he'd put out this crazy offer. I mean, this is hopefully going to make you all feel as sick as it makes me feel, as he offered a, an opportunity to coach with him for $3,000 for six sessions. And I thought, nah, you know, like that's a great thing, but I've spent all this money. Let's not take that up. And so then I waited six months. The business, hadn't, it was growing, but very slowly. And, you know, I had my struggle and I reached out to Steve and said, Steve, can we talk about coaching together? Because I knew I needed extra help. And I said, you still doing that 3K offer? And he said, no, I got so overwhelmed with demand. It's going to be now a 4K offer. And guess who didn't take him up on that? Yeah, that's right. This guy. So then I ignore it again. Yes, yeah, Steve, I want to work with you. And eventually when I go back to him, he says, you know, I, and I bet he just thought I was a tire kicker or something. You know, he just said, yeah, I'm not taking on one-on-one -on -one clients till next year. You know, and I basically said, no, I'm, I'm in, you know, like I'm not taking no for an answer. And I paid him more money for us to work together. But immediately from the moment that I hired him and started working with him, my business started to grow. And I really saw the difference. Like, but, you know, it wasn't like, oh, is this make a difference? It was like, I was still trying to figure out whether this coaching thing with Steve was worth it. Normally what would happen is I would sign up to a program or I'd do something and I'd convince myself it was a great investment, but my bank balance would be saying, no, it's not. And I'm like, yeah, but it's getting me there. I'll get, get there soon. With Steve, it was the opposite. I was going, I'm not sure about this. He's telling me all this stuff to do that's different than I've been doing. And, you know, it's hitting my ego, but my bank balance was growing. It was like the exact opposite because all he was focused on was doing the things that are going to help me grow my business and create clients. And he'd done it over and over again. And he knew what he was talking about. And whilst I might not have agreed with everything, I'm, as Rani may relate to this, I'm Indian, which means I like to get my money's worth for everything that I pay for. And so I implemented everything that he was telling me. I'm like, well, I'm not sure if he's right, but I'm going to try it. And I test, 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 test. And the business grew. And then years later, I went through another version of this, which was we'd got to the end of a year together. We'd been working together for a few years. And Steve goes, look, I think for you, Kush, the next level is an apprenticeship. And it was more than double the fee that I'd been paying him at that time. And so my wife was pregnant. We were like heavily pregnant. She wasn't going to be earning. She actually had a good thing. It was six months full pay, but then basically nothing for the next however many months. And she wanted to take nine months off. And so she was concerned that in essence, her pay over the next year was going to be reduced by a quarter. And, you know, she was earning more than me at the time. And so for her, for me to spend $60,000 working with a coach, right at the point that she was pregnant, we were going to have a kid was really foolish. I'll use a nice word. It was foolish. Uh, Ill-advised is uh, what was communicated. And I got really quiet and I went for it because I knew something was pulling me to do that. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't easy. It was really hard having a brand new baby and then having weekly coaching and trying to grow the business. And actually the first few months of my son being born, like the business went the opposite way. But being committed to working with Steve at that level and basically banking on myself, I was betting on me, right? Because one thing I knew working with Steve is he doesn't guarantee success. No coach does. This program doesn't guarantee success. My school doesn't guarantee success. My one-on-one -on -one coaching doesn't guarantee success. It's giving clients the framework to be really successful. And if you do the work, you will be successful. But that can't, I can't do that. Moritz, you can't do that. No coach can do that for someone else. So when I was committing $60,000, it was like, and I, I spent ages. I mean, it wasn't like Steve suggested and then the next day I went, yeah, I'm in. It was weeks of deliberation because it was so far out of my comfort zone. And I was talking to former like apprentices of his and some had done well and some hadn't done well. And I was trying to figure it all out. And I was so scared. And eventually I realized I'm not anyone else. I'm me. If I pay this, it doesn't matter if everyone else did well. And it doesn't matter if everyone else did this and they didn't do well. Am I going to make this work for me? And I'd had years of working with Steve. So I knew what he and I did worked. But it was that bet on me to go, right, now I'm going to do this. And I did. And the business grew. And then the same thing happened when I hired Steve Hardison, I did one session and that was very comfortable for me. It was a few thousand dollars. But then doing it, this five session package, which was another $45,000, that was like scary, you know, just for five sessions on top of the work I was doing with Steve Chandler, I was betting on me. And then at the end of the last year, I had no plans to do a year with Steve Hardison. And we get to the end of the year, I'm like, oh, I'd like to do a bit more. And he goes, yeah, it's a year or nothing. So this is like December, end of December last year. And it was, did not occurred to me that I could do a $200,000 coaching program with Steve Hardison. And again, it was that thing of I got quiet and I was like, knowing Steve and knowing the work we've done together, if somebody, and it doesn't have to be me or like 
if a version of me went and did that with Steve, would that be a good ROI? Would I make financially the money back? Forget all the other benefits. Like, of course you would. So the real question was, am I going to bet on me again and make sure I'm going to make that worth it? Because the only reason it's not going to be worth it is not if Steve does a bad job, it's like if it's on me. So that quality is a long way of me answering the question, but like the quality I'm looking for is a coach who's willing to invest in themselves, willing to invest in a coach, willing to be do what it takes to get the most out of that coaching. You could say the quality I look for is enthusiasm. So when I'm looking at working with a coach, I don't work with every coach. I've turned people away from my one-on-one. I've turned people away from my coaching school. A number one quality I'm looking for is enthusiasm. I don't want someone who's like, hey, convince me that working with you is going to be good. That's a red flag for me. I want someone who's going to bet on themselves and say, you know what, I'm going to be the best client you've had of everyone that you work with, right? I want that that passion. And then in, one thing I should also say is, like I said, I sound like a broken record. There's so many people who say, hire a coach, hire a coach. The problem with that advice I realized is people would go away, come back to me and say, hey, we hired a coach. It didn't work, Ankush. And I'd say, well, who did you hire? And they'd say, oh, John Smith. I was like, I've never heard of John Smith, right? Or some name. And I'd Google them. And every time the person I would Google, it was really clear to me they're an internet marketer. Like just so clear. We're going to help you put, put do funnels. We're going to help you do this. We're going to help you do that. And I would even go back to the coach and say, hey, uh, you didn't hire a coach. You hired a marketer. No, I didn't. He's, he's not an internet marketer. He's a coach. He, he says, and I'm like, no, it's he's there telling you, we help you create your this and this and this. No, no, no. And people don't even realize it. So don't just go and hire anyone. Don't just invest in anything. I am very, very particular. And it's funny to me. And I don't know if I'm making this up in my head. People have seen me over the years. Oh, he's worked with Chandler. Now they probably see me work with, oh, he's made of money, right? He's got money flowing out of his ears. He can afford to invest in my program. No, I'm very, very particular. I take all of my money and and put it exactly where I'm putting it. And you can Felipe's, you know, my business partner, he knows I'm stingy as anything, right? Like I will be careful about where I'm spending the pennies because I'm putting the money exactly where it's going to give me the greatest return because I'm running my business like a business, right? It's not like I've got excess cash and no one has extra $200,000 in a business, no matter what size, just like, oh, I'm just going to chuck $200,000 there. No, it's a business investment. Plus it's the flights, plus it's the accommodation, right? So it's a 200,000 pound investment for me to do do that work with Steve Hardison, right? So it's very, very deliberate. So if I wanted to work with someone, if I wanted to do a program and I couldn't test the program, I wouldn't do it right? Yes, with Steve Hardison, I had to pay to test it, but I still, I didn't jump into a year. I did a, a one-off session, then I did five, then I've done the year. Like I'm making sure this is going to be a good investment for my business. Because if I make a bad $200,000 investment, that may cost me my business. Maybe not, but it's a big dent, right? It's a very big dent. So I want to make sure it's being put in the right place. So if the one thing you want to take from this is be enthusiastic, bet on yourself, get a coach, test the coach, make sure the coach has got a track record for doing or helping people do what you want to do. So if you want to, for example, be the world's best listener, right? Go and hire a coach who's amazing at listening and has helped people become a better listener. I'll recommend Dr. Mark Howard, right? If you want to hire a coach who is helping you not only make money, but be different, right? Well, then hire Steve Hardison or someone who does that. Like Steve's really clear. I don't learn any strategy with Steve. I don't do technique strategy. We don't talk about that at all. We only talk about being. He is really rigid, not rigid. He is very focused on that, I should say. But I know what I'm letting myself in for. I'm hiring this guy to deepen my understanding of being and be different. I know what I'm getting. Steve Chandler, when I hired him, he was all about client systems. What are the systems put in place to create clients? I knew what I was getting. And I've hired not only my coaches, but I've had different mentors at different times. Know what you're hiring, right? Now, if you want to look at what coaches who are not successful, basically take the opposite right? So the qualities are they don't invest in themselves. They don't get a coach. They hire the wrong coach, right? And then you can add a whole bunch of other things on that, which are kind of offshoots of it. They procrastinate. They blame other people. They're going to victim mode. They're questioning. I mean, this like Steve Chandler said this to me as well. He goes, he used to get, and this is years ago, he would say to me like, it's so simple. And for me, to be honest, I didn't quite get it at the time because I was still going through my, like growing the business. But I could tell from him, it was like, it's so simple. Like, it's not easy, but it's simple. You want to grow a coaching practice. It's like, duh, 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 your version of that. But you do these certain things, you will have a successful practice, right? Get someone to guide you, do a lot of coaching, put things into action, make sure you have you're walking your talk, make sure you have your own soul line growth as well as goal line. If, I don't know if everyone understands that. So it's your own spiritual, personal growth as well as business goal oriented growth. You do all of that 
which is not complicated, you will have a successful coaching practice. There's nothing that I've done that other people can't do. In fact, so many of my clients grow their businesses way quicker than I have. I mean, like way quicker. So Peter McCammon, I've been working with him for two and a half years. He's a six-figure coach. It took me way longer than that to create a coaching, a six-figure coaching practice, right? Daryl Sweeney just hit six figures. We've been working together just over a year. I mean, he was coaching before then, but a lot of my clients are doing it way quicker. It's not like, oh, Kush is on here and he's like this special, unique guy. No, I'm I've done whatever I've done to create the business. I'm like, oh, this is really replicatable and doable. And part of the reason I work with coaches is because I see there's a need for this. I love the profession. I hope everyone on this call becomes very wildly successful because that boosts the profession and it helps the world, right? We're all in this together. So that's why I do what I do. So I could like literally talk for an hour. Is this helpful, guys? You dropped so much gold, so much gold. And what I wrote down here, like a couple of notes I took, but one was really like taking the responsibility you yourself to get the ROI. And one thing I recognize is present in many of the conversations I've watched or also experienced is that we tend to go and hope that there is a quick fix in something that we go into. Like, oh, if I hire this coach, then automatically I'm going to be successful. Or, oh, if I do this now, like get in conversations with people, then automatically I'm going to be successful. But what I hear in your story is like, you did the work, you kept doing the work over and over and over again. And I know you been working with Steve for nine years and now doing a year with Hardison. That's commitment. Yeah. Yeah. And it like, this is a way of being. I don't plan on stopping. You know, one of the things I see with the best coaches in the world, this isn't for new coaches. I mean, the best coaches in the world all get coached. You know, I've been working with Steve or I had been working with Steve. I have to keep saying that I'm getting used to not working with him. I was working with Steve Chandler for so many years. And one of the things I saw was he kept investing himself. He kept growing. He would have coaches. He'd have mentors. He'd been on program. He'd read books. I was I was just gobsmacked at how much he did. Because in my head, I was like, oh, you're Steve Chandler. You're the godfather of coaching. You know, you can just sit back and coach people and have a successful business. He didn't need, to, I mean, even when he was retiring or semi, like semi-retired now, even in that place when he's not going out and creating a big business or doing anything he was still growing it's just in him that's what he does and i see that in all the top coaches that they're different and for me you know and i've had some clients who work with me for years and years and years i'm not the same coach they first started i'm not the same coach i was a few months ago right i'm always growing and developing myself that's what makes me in a in i think a way of why people pay me because they're going to keep getting more and more I can keep listening to you and I think everyone else on the call can too, but I'm going to make an effort and I mean, go we into could some spend of the, the whole questions. call on this one question, really. <laughs> I believe you. I'm open to whatever you guys want. And I, the thing, if you ask me this question tomorrow, I'll come up with a different, not different completely, but I'll have something else to say on it because it, there's so much in it. I mean, it kind of what your whole program is really about. Yeah, I can ask a question. You just did. Uh, yeah, I did. That's it. You want another one? So yeah, on this topic, I'm curious because it, I think it's very easy for me as a coach to be blinded by my own capabilities or how good I think I am, or how not good I think I am. What do you look for as evidence of how good you are as a coach? Oh, this is so easy. This is so easy, right? The two things that you cannot bullshit. Am I allowed to say bullshit? I just said it twice, right? There's two things you cannot bullshit. There's a third time. You cannot bullshit your revenue, hmm. right? And I remember having this conversation with my wife. Hey, I'm doing really, really well. Like the things are, and she's like, do you not have any clients? <laughs> What's the income looking like this year? She's an accountant, right? You can't BS the numbers. I was with one of my clients today. So some of you might know Sachin Sharma. And we were talking about my coaching school and how it's compulsory as part of the school, as you guys know, every month we track the numbers. How much income have you made? How many, what's the level of proposals and how many conversations have you had? Because you can't BS it. And I knew I could have someone in my school go through the school for six months, sit there, yeah, take notes, tend to be a good client, not do anything. Oh, school doesn't work. If you track the metrics and certain metrics, you can't BS that. So what I look at is generically, well, okay, you think you're so good. Well, are you making any money? And it's not an exact science like, oh, if you're really good, you make this much. But directionally, you can't say it doesn't correlate. It really does, right? Now, if you want to go to a subset of that, let's look at that in a bit more detail. Okay, how many renewals are you getting? If a client is renewing with you, right, that tells me the coach is of a certain caliber because only the best coaches have re like Dee Hodderson, Steve Chandler, myself, right? Like Melissa Ford, all the top coaches, Karen Davis, they'll have people renew with them because when you're a really good coach, you're not just doing surface level work, like, you know, an inch deep, really good coaches. I mean, Steve Hodderson said this to me. He goes, he spoke to me, he goes, I've got enough to coach you. He made some notes. The last time I went to see him, I went, I had four sessions. And the first session, he had like a few pages of notes. He goes, I've got enough here to coach you for a year. 
He goes, in fact, there's so much here, I can't even, uh, we wouldn't even cover it in a year, right? A good coach can see so much in someone that they, you could coach them for ages. And I see that in me. Like I've got clients I've worked with and I'm just like, we're just scratching the surface. And when I was starting out as a coach, when I wasn't so good and I'm coaching someone, I was like, like, I remember the beginning, I was like, I got about an hour of content. I can talk to someone for an hour and then I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. And over time, as I've got better and better as a coach, that container of content is like, it's unlimited, right? So first thing you can't BS, are people renewed? with you? Are they asking to renew with you? Number two, are you getting referrals? Again, I remember this before. I had clients. Hey, do you know any clients like you? I'd love to coach people like you. Oh, I don't. I'm afraid. I don't know anyone like me. I'm unique. I don't know anyone else like me. I'm a freak in my whole friendship group. Same client a year later. Hey, I want to introduce you to someone. I think they'd be a good client for you. As I got better, referrals showed up. Again, if you and both you and Moritz know this with my school, there I've had so many referrals. In fact, someone signs up for the school I've had three people refer the same person, different people telling the same person you need to come in, right? I've had that with one-on-one -on -one clients. I've had three people tell the same person you need to hire Kush, right? Not every single person, not all the time, but it happens a lot. When I wasn't so good, that didn't happen. So when I'm speaking to a coach for the first time and I want to do a, like a, you know, when you check the oil level in a car, you use it, we call it a dip check, right? This is like a dip, really quick and dirty dip check of a coaching business, how good a coach is, roughly speaking, right? Referrals and renewals. The other thing, the other factor to this, like if you want to make it a three-dimensional uh, kind of thing, is the fee level. So if you're Steve Hardison and you're charging $200,000 a year and you're getting referrals and renewals, which he does, it's very different than if you're charging $2,000 thousand dollars a year getting referrals and renewals so it's about how good you are for your fee level and if your fee level is appropriate generally if you just reduce your fee level then renewals and referrals should go up because at that price point you're well worth it i have a very different expectation from someone who charges fifty dollars a session versus steve hardison who charges me eight thousand dollars a session right the expectation is higher or yeah just the expectation is higher so for me to renew with someone like that they've got to over deliver Right. When I worked with Steve last year, it was 45, it was $9,000 a session. Yeah, he was good, but he didn't need to just be good. He needed to be, you know, multiples better than Steve Chandler. Otherwise, I'd just carry on with Steve Chandler. And he was. And that's not knocking Steve Chandler. It was like he was taking me to a different level. Right. So you want to see that. You want to see that you can BS yourself. Oh, I hear this all the time. Hey, Kush. I'm a really good coach. I get such great feedback, but I don't know what to do. I've got no, I've got no clients. And I used to say this. I don't say this anymore because it just really upsets people. I used to say, you're not as good as you think you are. And then I used to upset a lot of people, right? I'm a little bit more nuanced now, but it's basically pointing to the same thing. For your fee level, if people are not renewing, if people are not referring, if you're not regularly having people sign up after they experience you, you've got to reach a higher level in who you're being and how you're coaching and the impact you're having in that time. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And if I may just do a follow up, you mentioned getting great feedback. Does it mean that is an indicative of being a good coach? Do you have other examples about how coaches may have uh, looked for evidence for how good they are, but actually it was not not a good evidence? No, like I've seen a coach, who I won't mention his name, and he used to run a program. On, when he launched his program, he had testimonials, like testimonials, they're not worth nothing, but people are skeptical of them. And I'm skeptical of them. This one coach, he had testimonials on his page for his program. He was selling this program, this three month program. And I saw it and I was like, I have spoken to those people privately. And I know what they've said privately does not match up with the testimonial right now, generally, and I, I'm sure your program is amazing, Moritz, right? But if you ask everyone in this program, hey, at the end of this call, we can do it today. Hey, everyone, if you had a great experience of this masterclass or whatever we're calling it with Kush, can you leave us a line? Now, some of you might think, oh, well, it actually was a bit shit, you know, it's all right. But you don't want to offend me and you don't want to offend Moritz. So you'll leave a line like, oh, well, we had a great time with the Kush, right? And I've had that. I've had coaches say to me, hey, can you leave me a testimonial? I'm like, I don't want to be a dick, right? Like, I didn't actually think it was that good. So in the past, I've just kind have gone yeah 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 and i've tried to like run away before they grab me in to get the line and i asked another coach this years ago and he said oh, i just give a really bad testimonial hoping they won't use it i'll put something in there that i think they won't publish but people don't like saying no so if a coach is saying hey or your client is saying hey it was great to work with you you're so good or whatever i mean it doesn't mean you're terrible but there's levels right there's a level where hey you're a great coach okay Hey, I loved working with you. 
is very different to don't you dare give my place away to someone else. I'm renewing. I'm letting you know six months before we finish. Totally different. And there's everything in between that, right? Let's take food as an example. You might go to a restaurant and the restaurant owner or the chef might come out and go, hey, did you enjoy your food? And you got hot. You know, it was great. Thank you so much. There's levels to that. There's levels to like, yeah, that was a pretty solid meal. That was cool. I'm happy with, I'm satisfied with what I paid with. And you might never ever visit that restaurant ever again. And then there's the, like the other extreme is you have changed my life with what I just ate. I've had a spiritual experience from this food right? I need to tell everyone I know about this restaurant. I'm going on to Google right now to leave you guys a review. I'm coming back. Can I book my Christmas party here? There's levels, right? For those of you who can visit London, there's a chocolate shop in London. I'll tell you this quick story called Paul A. Young. And my wife and I got to visit it when we were doing this chocolate tour. And unfortunately, the, the main shop in Soho closed down in COVID, but I think they've still got one shop left. And they won this award. I didn't realize it's this chocolate awards. Can you believe this, guys? They're not they're on TV. They should be. Chocolate awards. And this Paul A. Young won the gold award for a truffle, right? So you go in the shop and the first thing is you walk in the shop. The tour guy said, this is my favorite shop on all the tours we're doing. Just smell the smell. We walk in and you get hit by the smell of cocoa and it's amazing, unlike anything. And we all got one of these gold, standard gold award truffles, right? And it's sea salted caramel truffle. I'm not a real fan of sea salted caramel. I was like, okay, this sounds wrong. I don't know any other way to say this, but when I eat that truffle, it feels like there's an orgasm in my mouth and that sounds wrong right? But that's the only way I can say it. It's an experience. And I, because of that shop, I started trying sea salted caramel truffles elsewhere. And they were like, yeah, I don't, don't like them. I've taken every time I have someone come to visit me in London, I, when I used to live in London, we'd take them around London. I would take them to that shop. I was like, you got to have this. And we'd buy a truffle, it was like one pound a truffle or whatever, one pound 50. It was amazing. And every single person was the same. It was like, holy shit, like that was, what's in this? This is amazing. It's unbelievable. Now, I'm telling you all about this chocolate shop that I visited on a chocolate tour in probably 2017 or something, right? Six years later. There's very different between me. I've probably eaten chocolate over the years. I thought, oh, that's a nice chocolate. I can't remember it. Don't know where I had it. It's gone. There's levels to this. It's the same with your coaching, right? Steve Hardison has people tell him he's cheap. He is cheap. So for me, $200,000 is a lot of money. He's cheap what he does, right? 100%. And I always say you want to be cheap for what you do. That doesn't mean you want to charge a little amount of money. You can charge thousands of dollars a session and be cheap for what you do, right? And most coaches, now I'm answering the first question again, what's some of the qualities of coaches who don't succeed? They overcharge and underdeliver. Coaches who succeed do the opposite, massively, massively overdeliver. Moritz, you know this, in my school last year, I said, I want people to have their money's worth before we, the school starts. And you, you were one of the people who said, yes, I've had it this year, right? When I do my men's immersions, which you've attended, it's the same thing. Anything that I run, I'm like, I want people to get 10 times the value that they paid for this program or school or one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now, does it always work at exactly 10? No, but if you aim for 10, you're going to get some at 10 and maybe some at two, but they again, you're over delivering. And I'm constantly thinking about that, right? Whereas most coaches, one thing that really gets on my goat is when coaches talk about, hey, I just signed up a 10K client. They're focusing on the money. Why does, why does that matter? To me, it's like shout about, hey, my client has just healed his relationship with his son who was, his son was going to kill himself because he was depressed or whatever. And I've helped change. That's what I give a shit about. The money's going to come. And I'm not saying money's bad, but when coaches focus solely on the money and like, oh, I signed up a client at this amount, it kind of has you go into under delivery and overcharging, right? It can't not when you focus on money. And I've coached people like this. I've coached a coach who has signed up a client for a hundred thousand pounds. I've coached coaches who've charged more than me. And I also know behind the scenes of their business, what happens and how people ask for money back and how people have been unhappy because the coaches focus on, okay, how can I charge as much as I, as I can charge? And people are like, I remember when my men's immersions, when they were selling out back in the day, you know, some guy, and I used to tell everyone, like, I'm not hiding anything. People would reach out and go, Hey, your men's immersion is doing so well. How is it selling so well? How have you sold? Everyone sold out. How come, how come, how come? I would tell them, I literally would tell people, everything. And maybe it was foolish of me. Maybe I should have been more held back, but actually it didn't make a difference because every single person I told, guess how many of them copied me? Zero. You know what the number one feedback I got? 
That sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, no shit. It's not, you know, like, so I remember this one guy I spent ages with him and I got to the end and he go, like, he first started off, like, in those days, it was 1,800 pounds or 2,000 pounds or something. He's like, how do you charge 2,000 pounds and you've got 12 guys on it and it, every time it sells out? Like, you know, that's amazing. And I told him and, he, and the end of it, he went, you're only charging 2,000 for that. that. That doesn't make sense, right? And that's really important. Yeah, I'm giving people a bargain. The thing is, when you do that over time, your fees go up and up and up and up. I'm always winning because I'm always massive over delivery right and i think moritz and i we've talked about this and this is politically incorrect but i will say this and this is not exact so please don't quote me on this but it's like i deliver so much value that when i'm speaking with someone now if it's not a good fit that's different but when i know oh i've got something that can help someone with the issue and challenge they've got in my head if they don't sign up with me they're not all there something must be wrong up there because to me, it's such a no brainer for us to work together because the over delivery is so much, right? Like Steve Hardison said to me, he goes, anyone that hires me, they win. And he's told me a bunch of stories, which I'm not at liberty to share, but things he's done for his clients are insane. I mean, literally, in, like the value someone has got has even just financially, the number of clients he's given to his clients. So imagine you've got a coach working with him. He's given them so many clients. It's worth more than the value of the coaching they paid him for. Right. I mean, it's just it's extraordinary. Well, that's why he charges what he charges. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, this is so great. I see many people taking notes while you speak. I would say we just continue like that. There was Ronnie having a question around your document. And just a little disclaimer, not everyone in this group has a document. So not everyone knows exactly what the document is. We had some conversations about that by now. But Ronnie, you had a question about the document and living your document and how that impacted his business. Hi, hi, Kush. Good to see you Hello. here. Hello. Lovely to see you too. I can't remember my exact question, but I guess it would be around how do you, you know, once the, creating the document is only the beginning, like you have said in the past, and there's a whole process coming to that. And once you have created it, how do you keep living into your document day after day after day even when you like say the, uh, you know, there might be times when like it's happening to me like there are times when I say oh, gosh you know that's definitely not my, me in my document and then I say okay I forgive myself move on but I just wanted to, uh, because I first of all if you can share when did you first create your document like what like, how many months ago and how far you know how have you like stepped into it and have made it so tangible that it's not like you are you just are your document you just can't help it. Any tips that you could share for us, like maybe mm. do's and don'ts and that kind of thing? So that's a great question. So for those who don't know, I have a something called my document. It's something I created with Steve Hardison last year. The bulk of it in terms of the words was created in the first three sessions, right? So I had six hours of coaching with Steve Hardison. So I had one session in May. I went away. I came back after six weeks. I had another two sessions. So kind of early July, probably I kind of finalized it, but pretty much that was the bare bones of it. But I mean, even when I went there last month, we're still talking about it, right? It's like really the, the, the spine of the work that I do with him. I have a set of declarations, I am statements that I say every morning and every evening to create myself. Now, it's, it's a creation, right? So I tell people that when I'm saying these things, it's not like, oh, I'm just convincing myself or it's an affirmation it's a process and it's act it's like it's an active creation so my first line of my document i am loved and i am loving i could spend my the rest of my life just on that one line right because there's I'll give you an example. We've got a like private driveway and we've got three houses that share this private driveway. And my neighbor on this side is a great guy, South African guy, really, really nice. And he's helped me out. I've helped him out. He comes and looks after my fish when I'm away. He's a really great guy. My neighbor on this side has been here longer and I've had a few run-ins with him, right? I wanted to put, people couldn't find our house. We wanted to put a sign out. So I just say number two on the wall, but it's his wall, right? So one wall is his, one wall is this guy's. And he went, no, I don't want you you don't need it. You know, people will not find, they'll get confused with my house. In the moment, I was like, how rude, like there's nothing that you could say no to. That's such a reasonable request. And then I asked this guy, I'm like, hey, can we do it on your side of the wall then? Is that okay? And he went, yeah, I need to do it too. And when we're on the wall, putting the position, he comes out, the other guy goes, yeah, why don't you just move it further away? Right? So then I create a whole story about this guy and how he's this and he's that and, you know, don't like him and, you know, whatever. There's an electric gate. The electricity is paid for from this second guy. It probably costs him in about five or 10 pounds a year in electricity. And he's, he asked us for money for it. He's never done it before. He didn't ask the old owner. He's actually the lawyer who went through the documents, what they call them, the paralegal. He didn't put it on there. 
again, I had this whole story about this guy, like, you're really going to ask me for five pounds a year for electricity as like a neighbor and whatever. So I'd created this guy as just a horrible person. And then, you know, I have my document and my document is I'm loved and I'm loving. I'm not being very loving and I don't feel very loved when I'm creating him like this. So now what does that look like? Well, it's a different things, right? So we had our tree chop chopped down in the front garden shortly after this run in, one of the run-ins happened with him about the electricity. And he comes out to have a look and I, like he's at his car and I could have just left it. And I went, hey buddy, how's it going? And I wave at him and he comes over. I'm like, hey, we've got these logs. Do you want any for your garden? They could nice decorative. And I'm making an effort. Right. We just came back from Turkey and my mother-in-law had asked for some baklava and the hotel we asked, they gave us this massive box of baklava, which is way too much for us to eat. And so I said to my wife, like, why don't we give it to the neighbors? And my wife's like, are you just going to give it to this one? Do you really want to give it to that neighbor? And I went, yeah, I do. Because it's not about him. It's about who I'm being. So we now take out a little box and he's out cleaning his drains. So I go to him first. Hey, and I tell him and he just doesn't seem interested. He doesn't care. Like, you know, if you, you know, you give someone a present part, you like, oh, you want to say, oh, thank you. That's really kind. And so sweet. Nothing. You're like, oh, OK, cool. Like, cool. What am I going to do with this? Right. Like it wasn't a great I'm not doing it for that. It's not about him. It's about me. I'm being that. And so everything is practice. Everything is practice for being that. Right. When my wife and I have a conversation and she's, I don't know, hey, honey, I told you didn't tell me that. And I'm like, yes, I did. I 100% told you, you weren't listening to me. Right. If I go into argument mode, am I being loving? Am I being loved? And no, I'm not. So this is like last night. Some, she said something and you didn't tell me. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, maybe I didn't communicate it well enough. And I'm listening to her. I'm being my document. Right. That's just the first line. I've got like 50 lines in my document. Right. Well, I'm an amazing husband and father. Well, there are opportunities to be that. Right. Just I'm an amazing husband. Just that I can I could meditate on that and create my whole life about being that for the rest of my life. That's one half of one line. Right. So there's so much I could do with my document. There's so many places I can be it. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff I tell my clients to do. Right. Write it out. If you're right handed, write out left handed. Right. Make sure you memorize it. You don't want to have it that you have to refer to a piece of paper. I, I get my clients to print their document out at least A2 size, you know, like that big, you know, or A1, that flip chart there is A1, right? So my clients will have this print out. I tell them, get it designed by a graphic designer, frame it, put it up on the wall, make sure you share it with people. So one of my clients recently, Oliver, we helped create his document and he had a 40th birthday party and two of his couples, good friends, he got them in the garden. He said, may I share something with you? And he was really nervous and he set a camera to record. And you might have seen this in the school. He shared the post today and he's sharing his document with people. The more you share it, the more real it becomes. I mean, I can talk about a bunch of stuff you can do, but beyond that, that's minimum. It's like, it's really being it. And then you're not going to be it all the time. I'm not my document all the time, but there's always opportunities, right? Another line in my document, I am that I give freely of my time, energy, and resources, right? Part of that is the baklava. I'm giving it away, right? Whereas the old me would be like, hey, uh, no, it's really tasty. I want to keep, even though I know I can't eat it all, I would not do that. Like, but I might want to, what if someone comes to the house and I want to give, you know, there's all this stuff. No, I am that I give freely. So I give it. Right. I was, we went on holiday last week. We took, I think about my wife got 60 or 80 $1 bills from the currency exchange. I said, you should tell them you're going to a strip club. Cause we got all these $1 bills and we're out in Turkey and I'm tipping the waiters, right? I'm tipping the hotel staff. And I would never have done that before. And my brother-in-law does it. He was kind of brought up in the Middle East and there's much more big tipping culture out there. Um, so anyway, we're going to Turkey and I'm noticing I'm the only person who's tipped. I've the whole week we were there. It was a really nice hotel. I didn't see a single person tip their tip boxes. I didn't see a single person put a tip in there. Nothing. The most I saw is when people arrived, they left a few coins with a coach driver, right? As a tip. Never saw anyone tip. But here's the thing, right? I, there's a saying I have, you can't outgive the universe, right? So we take what 80, we didn't even use it all. I'm, I don't know, must have tipped 40, $50 while I'm there. Three, four, five dollars of that, right? One day there's a guy standing there, he's the executive chef. My son doesn't want to eat whatever food they made. And it was amazing food. It was such beautiful food. And he just wants plain spaghetti, just plain pasta with a bit, maybe tomato sauce. So we asked the guy, I'm like, hey, really such tries to trouble you. You know, we're vegetarian and my son just wants to eat you know, spaghetti. And, and he's like, do you want what do you want basil? Do you want veg no 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 we just want plain. Okay, great. Calls his minion over, right? Hey, da 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 speaks in Turkish, go and cook it up. And then he goes, go and sit down. We'll bring it to your table. So we sit down, he brings it over. My wife's like, my son still didn't eat it. Right. My wife ate more of it and she was like, this is the best spaghetti I've ever like it was so good. So I'm like, oh, I need to go and tip. So I go back I, and he's gone inside. 
online so i asked the staff can you bring him out please so he comes out and i acknowledge him right so i i really want to thank you you know for you doing that that meant a lot to me i really appreciate it it's so hard when we travel to get food and whatever and i just want to say thank you and i just handed him like five euros or five dollars some, something right the rest of the trip every time he saw us he's like shaking my hand telling me what food there is do you want me to do anything extra for you one day we're there and we're like hey no no we're just having a look in the main restaurant we're actually going to one of the a la carte restaurants he goes right what's your room number and we're like oh uh, it's this he goes i'm phoning the chef now and he phones the chef of the other a la carte restaurant going right you need to look after these guys right on the last day we're like hey we're leaving tomorrow do you mind making a little packed lunch for my little one you know it was around food time and whatever he goes right i'm not here tomorrow this is the name of my sous chef he writes it down everything gives it to me the amount of food they gave us to take away and it was so i've never eaten such a nice sandwich in my life if we had bought that at the airport like the sandwiches were like nine euros each right the baklava box the size of box he gave us was probably like 20 30 euros you can't outgive the universe i'm getting back not that i did it for that but i realized i got back more than i gave right but for me to learn that lesson it's not just theoretically i've got to be it there's opportunities for me to be this everywhere Right. A few weeks ago, someone who was a CEO who I coach messaged me and said, hey, can you share this? My daughter's doing this thing for mental health and she's doing a play and can you sponsor her? And I went, yeah, yeah, sure. And then like, I didn't. And normally I'd just like, oh, I'm just going to forget to do it. And I come back from like, right, no, I can't do this. Right. Sponsor. And I sponsored a good amount. Right. The universe is giving you opportunities to be a document all the time, every day. Right. Now, if you don't have a document, some people say, I want to be the best coach in the world. Great. There's opportunities every day to step into that, right? You guys have all done that through signing up to this program. That's an opportunity, right? When there's opportunity to ask questions, ask a question. Ask a question that you might think makes you look stupid. One of the piece of advice that one of my clients, Sachin, I'll just say Sachin Sharma, who's Ronnie's coach, he he's, he, he did a two-year apprenticeship with me. He's the only person I've taken on for two years as an apprentice. And he wanted to have a session with Steve. So we arranged that. We've never done it before, never done it since. Won't do it again. We had a session with him and Steve Chandler with me sitting in on it. And he asked Steve the question, what advice can you give me to get the most out of my two years of coaching with Ankush? Because there was a lot of money for him as well. Steve said, bring into your coaching sessions the thing that makes you look stupid and the thing that you are afraid to bring in, right? And credit to Sachin, he has done that, right? So that's just one piece. Now, if you are have a document or you just have a way of being like, I want to be the best coach I can be or I want to be the best coach in the world or whatever version of that you have, a lot of coaches have that. Well, use your coaching. If you've got a one-on-one -on -one coach or you've got this program, do that. Right. How long have you guys got left, Moritz, in this program? We have three more calls. Right. Who can win the test of looking the most stupid in the next three calls? Right. Who's going to win the prize? You will win and you'll be surprised. Right. Like people who bring in the questions like, oh, man, I bet everyone knows this. I don't know where to get conversations from. Oh, I should know that by now. I don't know who to talk to. Right. I, I don't really know how to make a proposal. I've kind of been winging it. Right. All the questions you think you should know the answer to, bring them in, ask them. The more you're willing to do that, the more you're going to grow and develop. That's just one example. You can do that in a marriage too. Right. You can do that anywhere. If you're willing to look stupid, you can you can shift and grow and develop. Again, I could spend this whole, you know, rest of this what hour that we've got ronnie answering your question ronnie is this answering your question uh, yes and i'm assuming because we well assuming uh, i think i know the answer already what you're going to say but we are in this being business program so it's all about being and i get a sense that the more you're living a document you're also seeing huge returns in your business is this right to assume that massive but it's like everything is a side effect so yes i'm seeing returns in my business but i'm seeing it in my marriage I'm seeing it in my relationship with my son, right? I'm seeing it in my own self-worth and happiness, right? I'm seeing it with my neighbors. If I didn't have my document, I would have created a story about my neighbor, which is not a very nice story. It's not a very kind story. Guess who is the most affected by that? Me. If I have a horrible story about this guy who lives opposite me and I'm creating him as a not very nice thing, I experience that every time I see him. I think, ah, oh, that's so-and-so. Right now, if I experience it, like, I love that guy. I'm happier for it. Everything is an offshoot of that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, one of the things I'll say, the biggest thing that shifted last year in my work with Steve Hardison was if you want to boil it down to two words, it was self-esteem, right? As my self-esteem rose as a coach, as a human being, as a person, like what I'm creating in the world has just become way bigger. You know this, Moritz knows this, Felipe knows this. When I ran my school last year, originally it was a school. Then at a certain point, 
I had this I thought there's like, oh, this isn't about running a school. This is about changing the industry. Now, if I had a low self-esteem, a low opinion of myself, I would have been, who am I to say that? Who am I to say, I'm going to change the coaching industry? I'm not Marshall Goldsmith. I'm not Steve Hardison. I'm not, you know, uh, Warner Earhart. But now, like, who am I not to? Why not me? No one else is doing it. Not that I'm aware of. No one else is talking about it and creating that in the world. So I, I put that out there. And then what happens is I put this inspiring vision out there of changing the industry and people are excited by it and they're following me. And some people are judging me for it. Some people are saying, who does he think he is? It's all happening, right? Steve says this whenever he speaks, Steve Hardison, he goes, he was in a room in London uh, last year. He goes, in this room, there are people who are thinking I'm the Messiah. There's people who are thinking this is great. There's people who are thinking this is shit. He goes, there are people in this room who are judging me right now. It's happening everywhere. The thing is that happens anyway. When my self-esteem gets higher, I get less affected by people judging me a lot less. So then I can go off in the world and create what I want to create. That's, you know, you want to be being business, be that. And it, again, I've seen it and I, man, I, I used to have the lowest self-esteem that when I was a teenager, I know, I know a lot of teenagers go through, but, and I've written about this in my book. I felt like I was worth less than, you know, dirt on someone's shoe. Really? I had no self-esteem, you know, and I've come through from that all the way through and all the way through and all the way through. And I've seen as it's grown and it's grown and it's grown, and it's grown that not only am I worth more, but so is everyone else because it's universal. That's great for a coaching practice. It's great for a business because that manifests in so many ways, right? Whenever we're, I mean, this is a small thing for you guys to test out, right? Whenever you're feeling defensive about something, that's not telling you about what the other person said, that's in you. And it's probably triggering something and it's probably triggering something that is your insecurity, right? One of my clients told me recently that they <laughs> they had another coach say to them a few years ago, uh, I want to fight you, right? You trigger me, I want to I wanna come and knock you out, right? And the coach, my, my client was brilliant. He he laughed and he said, you know, this isn't about me. There's, there's something you might want to see here. Do you want me to help you with that, right? And the person couldn't believe it, right? And by the way, I've been the judged and I've been the judger. This isn't about making other people wrong, right? And if you're all honest here, you've all judged other coaches at some point. Maybe Maybe you've judged other people on this program. Maybe you've judged Moritz. Maybe you're judging people right now. Maybe you're judging me right now. Like everyone's done that. Everyone. So whether you have a document or not, like that's something to really, I mean, you, you want to grow your business really like drop that. That's huge. And it like for me, it seemed so well-meaning. Oh, I'm judging other coaches because I'm, you know, like I'm a stalwart for like the profession. And I'm, you know, I had this thing of like, I'm sticking up for the little guy. So it's okay to judge these other coaches because they're not like doing the right thing and they're taking advantage of people and blah, 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 blah. I didn't realize it wasn't, you know, it's got nothing to do with the other coaches. It was all about me and my insecurities. Powerful. Bard, um, I saw your hand up. You want to add, ask something? Yeah, thank you, Moritz. Thank you, Ankush. There are not a lot of people I set in uh, the speaker mode when I'm listening to Zoom, but uh, this is a call I put you on speaker mode. <laughs> so thank that, you. that doesn't mean a lot, but to me it does. I have a question. You spoke about vision. I was wondering where it is born, like vision, like you, you said, from shifting from sh school to changing the industry. Can you speak about the point where it dropped in and the point it shifted vision and it actually about future and looking to the future yeah i mean this is this is one thing i found right there's a really great book by steve chandler called shift your mind shift the world and it's like the chapters are really short and the first two chapters were like is worth the whole book it's a big thick book the whole book is great but the first two chapters are amazing and what steve talks about is he goes you can dream small like everyone talks about dreaming big dream big but you can dream small now Steve, showing his age, is a fan of Elvis Presley or, uh, yeah, he's a fan of Elvis Presley. And I didn't know this, like Elvis could be a contender for the greatest, most successful, you know, recording artist of all time. I don't know the exact numbers, but he's right up there, right? And his vision wasn't to be that. His vision wasn't to be the king of rock and roll. Apparently, his original vision was to record a song for his mother. So he goes into this recording booth and he sings and he just takes his little record out and he goes home. He wasn't trying to get a record deal. He, he His vision was like, I want to record something for my mother. And Steve writes about this in the first, I didn't know this. He tells the story of the chapter. And from having something small, dreaming small, like, oh, that's like a little thing. 
then it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. My vision was when I started out coaching was I wanted to be able to earn a living coaching, coaching men. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to coach men. And my income was a lot more than this, but I don't know why in my head, if I make 30,000 pounds a year and I do what I love, that's all I care about. I was willing to take a pay cut and I don't know why I picked 30. I just picked 30 from something. I was like, I could probably move to Eastern Europe and live off 30,000 and be quite comfortable. That was the thought in my head. So this has all evolved over time. It, I didn't suddenly go, I want to change the coaching industry. It's like, oh, I just want to make 30,000 pounds a year. I just want to work with men. Then it was like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. And it's changed and evolved over time. And right now, what I'm up to is like, I want to change the coaching industry. That may evolve again. It may be added to, it may, it may be tweaked. I think we have an obsession with vision in our culture. And again, Steve Chandler told me this. He goes, when I was a kid, you know, how many, you know, 100 years ago, he would say, if you had a brain surgeon, and you spoke to a brain surgeon, say, in the 50s, right? You wouldn't hear a brain surgeon say, I'm passionate about brains, right? I'm really passionate about cutting people's head open and playing with their brains. They're like, no, I'm competent. I'm good at what I do. It was something like, I think in the 50s, there was some study done or something where some person started writing about vision and passion and, you know, having like really having that in your mind. And there was some study done where they, I think it was, a, was it Harvard students or something where they went, they looked at people 20, 30 years later and the ones that had a real strong uh, reason, a, a vision did were more successful than the ones that weren't. But it was like one study and that's now become part of our culture. But it's not fact. It's not the only way to be right? There's so many other factors. So for me, it's funny, people see me and I'm doing great stuff and I, and I am, but it's like, it was just real step by step by step by step and it's evolved. And, you know, like Steve Hardison's calling me, goes around calling me MG, which is really took me by surprise, which stands for modern Gandhi, right? Now, I'm thinking, what? Like I had, you know, what I thought I could create was this. And I, to be a called a modern God, like that's like, what does that look like? In my mind, it's like a whole different level of being right? So who knows where that will take me? But I'm just, all right, well, what I'm up to right now? Okay, I'm going to do that. And what I'm up to right now? And so sometimes I think it can be really helpful. And it can be helpful to have a goal. It can help to have a vision. But I always say, let it come through you. None of my visions have been like, oh, that sounds really good. Let me write this down. I tried to do that. It didn't work. But like, it was at some point towards the end of last year, this, it came through me, it came from in my heart, like, oh, this is what I'm up to. But it's kind of like, after the fact, it's like, oh, I'm kind of already doing it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Let me now speak that into the world. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, certainly. For, for me personally, yes. When I work with people or clients and you speak with them or you feel them, then they probably have another image of themselves. But I sometimes I feel like they have they are under visioning themselves or something. Like you see you see the potential there. And yeah, I'm not really sure if you can share it with clients or if it's a positive thing to share it because you, you push them forward as a, as a kind of by sharing some things. I would definitely share that. I think speaking what you see as possible for clients is a wonderful thing. And you don't have to push. You can just create the space and say, you know, I see this as possible for you. Chances are they're not often not going to believe you anyway, because it's probably way bigger than they're th thinking. And you can just leave that there. And then, you you know, it's like playing at different levels. You can say, hey, this is how I can see you be this. I had a client who recently last year made hit 85,000 pound revenue in his business. And he was telling me, hey, I make 85. And I just said to him, I like, you know, you can make 10 times that. And he thought I was just saying it like 10 times. And I went, no, no, literally, I see you making £850,000 a year. Now that's up here. And it kind of blew his mind. And then he, so we had a conversation about that. Now that's left there. And then we also work here on a day to day. What are we doing day to day? So I don't need to hold him there like, right, let's create this and let's make a banner and put 850 on it. And like, no, I just hold it there. Let him know it's possible. Let him step into that. And he doesn't have to. And then we get back to, okay, well, what are we doing now? Thank you for answering. Yeah, you're welcome. Right. We had a question. I thought it would be interesting to ask you that as we asked that, Steve, and I think it's a, such a big thing in a coaching practice, this word service and what it means to really serve people in a context of running a coaching business. And Luca, you had some questions around that that you would like to give to Ankush. Yeah, thank you very much. My questions for serving has been like Ankush, what have or how do you perceive like serving what is the essence of it but also how do you somehow experience how do you evolve in serving and how do you see different styles of serving so there are actually three questions in it but yeah maybe you can ask uh, answer that so i'm going to be reminded need to be reminded of the three but the first one what no is problem. the essence of serving to me the essence of serving is love 
Like if you really want to boil down to it, how do I serve my clients? Just anywhere where you see the word serve, change the word to love. How do I love my clients, right? How can I be of greater service? How can I love someone more? It's the same thing, really. And and sometimes it's more helpful because people think, oh, I'm serving and they're not. The loving kind of cuts through all of that, right? And this is why I think it's so important to have that spiritual element to your work and to everything that you're doing because all spirituality is pointing to love. It really is. And this is where, to me, the self-development, psychology, spirituality, all kind of combines in one in coaching, right? And it's not like a soft, gentle love. It can be, but it, it's love. You know, I have a three and a half year old. I love him so much. Like, it's, you know, as, if anyone's a parent, they know like the love you have for your child is unbelievable. You don't realize how much love you can hold in your heart for a child. And there are times when we have to tell him off. It's not loving if I just let him do what he wants all the time. It's really not loving right? He needs to learn. No, he needs to understand. And it's not an exact science. You kind of work back and forth with it. But you know, we see that often as parents and people can understand that even if you don't have kids, right? Love isn't softly, softly, gently, gently all the time. It can be. And sometimes it can be very direct, right? Sometimes it can be really strong. Sometimes it can can rattle you, right? This is why I think in the Prosperous Coach, they say, you know, be willing to say to someone what no one else is willing to say. Now, some people misunderstand that. They think, ah, oh, I'm going to tell this person what I really think of them. It's not loving, but you can do that in a really loving way, right? So someone might say to you, hey, Luca, you know what I see in you? You've been playing it really safe. Now, I don't know if this is true. I'm just saying it, right? But someone might say to you, hey, Luca, you've been playing it really safe. I, I see all the success you're having. And I think, you know, in your heart, you're only operating at 10%. Now, that not be really nice on one level, on another level, like that's the most loving thing someone could say to you. You're like, yeah, shit, you caught me out. Thank you for saying that. Right. I had someone reach out to me and they said to me, I'd spoken to them years ago and they saw me and they saw me doing really well. This is like only a few months ago. And they said, hey, I want to tell you something. I've been judging you silently for years and I've been judging you because you're so similar to me. And yet you're so much more successful than me. I haven't been. And I went and I went back and I acknowledged him and I went, hey, no problem. And I appreciate you sharing that. And look, there's no competition for me. There's not some scale. If I can be of service to you, let me know. So he says, yeah. So we set up a call and I say to him, and I say this beforehand, let me know what would make it a useful call. Like, let's have some intention for the call. So he messages me, apologies if you heard me tell this story before some of you have, he messages me and he says something along the lines of, hey, you're like a step ahead of me. So I don't have like a real strong intention, but you're one step ahead of me. So I just want to hear what you have to say, right? Now I'm going to say something, please listen to where I'm coming from. This isn't about me and it's not about ego, but I said something very strong to him. So listen to this. I said to him really at the start of the call, I said, hey, I want to say something to you. And I'm saying this with absolute love. I'm not saying this out of ego. Please hear this in the way that it's meant. I'm saying this to really serve you, right? Can you do that? He says, yes. I said, you sent me a message saying, hey, uncle, you're one step ahead of me. I'm not one step ahead of you. I'm 10 steps ahead of you. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. If you listen to me as if I'm one step ahead of you, this is what you're going to do. You're going to listen to me as like, oh, this is Kush's way. Now I've heard this other guy who's this way and there's someone else is this way. And there's, and you're just going to put me in this realm of like information and you're not going to take anything from this that's really going to help you. But if you put me in the place of like Moritz created me at the start of this call, hey, I'm in the top 0.5% of coaches. Please listen to me like that, not because it makes any difference to me, but it'll make a difference to you. If you listen to me, it's like this guy really knows what he's talking about. And you give it some importance, like, wow, you know, this is really useful. That's it's going to help you because otherwise you're going to go, oh, well, OK, this is what his opinion. Right now, I would never have said that before, but that's me being really loving to both myself and to him. It's not shouting. It's not getting angry. It's not getting pissed off. It's not. It is loving. And it's not usual. That's not a usual thing to say. Right. I've had a I had a client years ago. He was at my immersion and he was like, oh, I'm with my girlfriend. I don't really want to be with her. But, you know, I can't break up with her because, you know, I don't want to hurt her. And he was playing out this victim story of like he had. A, I'm a good guy because I'm not breaking up with her. And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, that's the most selfish thing I've ever heard in my life. And it was like, boom, right? That might sound harsh, but it was very loving. And he said to me, even like at the time he said it was so helpful. And then he told me years later, he goes, you know, you know, when you said that to me, that was so helpful. Like years later, we had a conversation. He said, thank you so much for that. Right. That's what I'm talking about when I'm that's service. That's also being loving. Right. It's being willing to look bad. Some of the things that I say, some people might judge me. You guys might judge me on this call. But if I'm so worried about what people think of me, how can I really love? How can I really serve if I'm too worried about me rather than worried about you?
right? Now, I think you asked the question of like, how did this evolve over time? I'm going to go back to the very first thing that I said. I'm constantly working on myself. I've got a coach. I'm always getting coached. I'm on programs. I'm always getting better. I'm doing whatever to get better. Right now, I'm working with Steve Hodison. I'm guessing for most of you, maybe all of you, that financially not might not be workable right now, right? You don't have to work with Steve Hodison. Do what you can at whatever level. There's so many amazing programs, coaches, people out there, right, that you can learn from. And you incorporate that in what you do, you will grow, right? And especially on the spiritual side, the more you grow on that side, the more you will love, the more you will serve, right? So I did a lot of work with something called the three principles. The essence of the three principles is love, right? But you might want to work with some Byron Katie stuff. You might want to, I don't know, go even in Landmark. Like Landmark can be, some people think is ruthless and very direct, but the essence of it, it's very loving, you know, because they don't let people keep buying into their stuff. They, they confront it straight and it might not be your thing. If that's okay, but find something that calls to you and go deeper on that journey. As I go on the journey of self-love. Right. I remember Steve, one of the things Steve Chandler would say is no one wants to hire an unsuccessful success coach. Right. So true. On one hand, you don't need to be perfect. And on the other hand, right, the more you have your shit together, as we might say, the more people want to work with you. I, I worked with a guy called Dick and Bettinger a few years ago. Part of the reason I worked with him was the guy oozes love. Like he, I feel he's love incarnate. That matters, right? And I've seen other coaches where you think, oh, they've got ego here. They got, I can see it. Loads of people can see it. That's off-putting. So just stay on that path and know it's never, you're never done ever. All right. I remember Carolyn Freya Jones, who's a wonderful coach in the States. She has this video out there where she was speaking at the University of Santa Monica with her former business partner who passed away, Michelle Bauman. And she goes, to me in coaching, like having a coach, it's a fixed cost. People see it as a variable cost. And I've seen a bunch of people that hire a coach, the business will go, all right, I'm going to take a pause now. And they stop. And she was like, to me, it's a fixed cost. There's a amount I'll pay for a coach a year that's baked into my business. And that's true for me maybe slightly different for me because the number keeps going up. But, you know, it's true. There's always that cost. That's not optional for me. And to me, it's great because I love getting coached. I love growing as a person, right? If you don't, maybe you're in the wrong profession. And by the way, this is not just for coaches, you know, like I'm going to share something with you. Oh, I'm really glad I can share this with you, right? So here's a little story from Turkey, right? So it's Friday. My hair's quite long. I need. I didn't get time to get it cut before I left for Turkey. I'm like, I'm going to go to a traditional Turkish barber. There's not one in the hotel. Check on Google. There's one in the local town right? It's like a 25 minute walk, which I don't really fancy doing in 36 degree heat. So I speak to the front desk and I say, how do I get into town? They go, right, we'll call you a taxi, right? Great. I was kind of going for the experience. You know, it's not about saving money. I've got a Turkish barber, like a five minute walk from my house, which I get my hair cut and I really like it. I was like, well, let me do the Turkish barber thing in Turkey. So I'm asking everyone, which one's a good one? They went, no, they're all good. Just the taxi driver will drop you off to one. So okay, great. Get in the taxi. They call a taxi. Five euros. Great. Drops me off in town outside a random ta random hairdresser place. There's no prices anywhere. I've asked someone in the resort, how much should it cost beforehand? And he goes, it should cost you about 15 euros, which is a, just for reference is about $16.50, right? $16.50 roughly. So add dollars on me. So I go into this shop and they say, don't sit down, negotiate the price first. So I tell him what I want. I want the full works, shave, haircut, you know, do whatever, the whole, everything you do, ear waxing, all this stuff, right? It's like, give me the full Turkish experience. And he goes, all right, it's $40. So I got euros, pounds, I got dollars. So he gets his calculator out. He goes, oh, it's $40. And I went, come on, mate. He's like, that's more expensive than the UK. So he goes, all right, all right, I'll do it for 35. And I was like, oh, no, I'm, no. Because I, I pay 35 pounds in, in my local place. So I was like, this is Turkey. I was like, come on, do it for $20. I knew because I knew it should be about $15, $16. But like, like, let's do it for 20. So he goes, mm, okay, sit down. All right. So we sit down, he starts doing the thing. And this guy, I start talking to him. He starts telling me he's born in the place. I was like, did your dad teach you how to do all this? No, I'm self learn His kid's there, his kid's lathering up the soap. He gives me the best shave I've ever had in my life. It's amazing. Oh, unbelievable. And in my head, I'm already writing the Google review, right? And I really like the guy. Uh, it's, look, it's their thing. They charge more. That's the deal. Great. Now you're doing a great job. And I'm talking to him. He's talking to me. Great thing. Right. So I'm there. And, I, and then in my head, I'm doing this thing. I'm loved and I'm loving. I give freely my time and energy. So I'm like, I'm going to tip him. I'm going to tip his other guy. And I'm going to tip his son. And I'm going to say, this is for your son. Go and buy yourself something nice. Right. And I'm going to leave him an amazing review. I'm going to take a photograph. 
right? So I've got all this going on in my head. And in my head, I'm like, I might even tip him $20. I'll give him the 40 that he wanted because he's done a great job and I feel good about it. So he does the whole thing. And then he goes, do you want a face mask? And I'm sure, why not? Right. So he goes, all right, puts this stuff on my face. He goes, sit there for 10 minutes or wash your face. So I sit there for 10 minutes. He washes my face. We come to pay and I get a $20 bill out. And he goes, oh, no, it's 25. I said, why? He goes, oh, we did the face mask. And I start laughing. So I, I go, I kind of half expected this. So guess how much tip I leave him? Zero right? Zero tip. And I still take a photograph with him because I'm going to do it. I still leave him a Google review. And it was actually a really nice Google review. And I said, you know, but please be aware. I left him four out of five stars because I said, to be honest, it was an amazing experience. And the reason he lost five stars is because he tried to overcharge. Please be really clear that if they ask for any additional things, you're very clear on the price, right? Now, a lot of people run their businesses like this. How can I get the most money out of a client? I talked about this earlier. Coaches just focus on money, right? So I'm creating this thing called the barbershop distinction. It's under delivery is overcharging, right? You want to be like that guy. He's missed. Now I'm, how many people I'm going to tell that story to, right? I could be telling the story of the greatest barber on earth. I could have written a Google review about the greatest barber. I could have told everyone in the hotel, hey, you know, recommend this guy. He's amazing. He gave me his card. I could have said to him, give me 10, give me some more cards. I'm going to leave them at the hotel. I'm going to tell everyone at the hotel to send them to you, right? Right. My son needed a haircut. I'm like, going, you know, what? I'm going to bring my son down. Can you cut his hair? Right. It's a short termism that people have that they focus just on the sale and trying to maximize the, the money as opposed to, you know, really loving. Was that the most loving thing you could have done? No. Is that most service? No. And he doesn't realize he didn't actually get any extra. He probably made less money out of me because I didn't tip him. But let's say, even though I was going to tip him five dollars, he made the same amount of money, but he's making less money because now I looked at Google after that. There were a few of the reviews and they gave them a much harsher review. They gave one star and two star because they'd done the same thing to them, right? That affects his business, right? Again, you want to come back to being business. That, that's who he's being. He's being the guy. How can I? And he's a nice guy and he's good at what he does. He doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to fleece tourists for a few extra dollars, right? You probably think, well, I don't, I'm not going to see him again. It matters. Now imagine there's a barber in town. He never does that. Who goes over and above. Say, so, you know what? Normally I charge $5 extra for the face mask, but you know, I, I like you. Right. And in fact, he tried to do it twice because he asked for the face mask. Then he said, do you want this hair mask? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want a hair mask. And I read the reviews. He charged people $10, $15 for this hair mask thing. And he said, it's his thing. Right. It can't not come back to you. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Great. I'm feeling like letting the questions come from you guys because we're, we're getting in a really deep space and feel this conversation is going about being more than about anything. So if a question emerges in you, just put your hand up. And if nothing happens, I have some backup questions from you guys. Or if any of the questions you guys asked that we haven't covered yet, like feel free to ask them now too, because they were great questions. Mario sent me a bunch of them. They were all great questions. Or we can just stare at each other. That, that's cool too. Yeah. I, Enjoy the I, feeling. I really loved Ina's question. So I don't know if Ina, you want to ask it because it was your question, but I would love to, to hear that one. I just wanted to say that it, it really covers a bit like what, what Luca said, and it really answers a bit what I was asking, is about how to turn a casual conversation into a next conversation, because I'm in the beginner stage of, of the coaching practice, and yeah, that's something I'm up to right now. But it is about, this is one thing I can feel, it, it is about love, and loving them, and just serving them, and then, yeah. For me, the love is all there. That's not the point for me. But then turning it into something workable for me to turning it into a conversation or a next enrollment conversation. That's something I'm bumping up to. Can I give you some examples? Can I talk to that? Yes, right? please. Because it's really helpful. And it took me some time to get this. And now it's like second nature. And I'm going to talk about how when I talk to coaches, but this applies to anything, right? So when I talk to a coach, like literally the first few minutes of I'm talking to, imagine I'm on a phone to a coach. Hey, well, let's connect. I'd love to connect with you, right? It's not scheduled to be a, anything else, right? It's not like, hey, can you coach me? Let's say I'm just talking to them. So very quickly, I'll just say, hey, what would make this a really useful call for you? I'm setting the context for the call. I don't want it to be a casual conversation. I don't do casual let's chat. I'm busy. I've got stuff to do, right? So the context is so important. I don't just, hey, let's chat. Let's catch up. Let's network. Why? Not got time for that, right? So this is where a lot of coaches get mixed up. So, hey, what would make this a really useful call with you? Now, a lot of the time I'm speaking to coaches. So often what comes up is some version of, can you help me grow my business? Or I'd like to grow my business. Or I'd like to be more impactful, right? It's some version of that. 
typically. So this is what I do when I'm like, and I know it like, it just creates a different conversation. I'm asking a bunch of questions. How long have you been coaching? What do you charge? How long are the packages? How many clients do you have? What's full for you? I'm going through, a, and these aren't like scripted. They're just coming to me that I want to know. Do you often get referrals? How often do you get renewals? Like the things that I'm talking about, because I want to get this dip check of where the person's business is at. Just by asking those questions, the context is so different for a conversation and it's very loving. Right now, let's say I'm I'm talking to someone who's not a coach. I have clients who are not coaches. I had a client recently, and his biggest thing was his relationship. So he's a referral. We get on the call. Right, I don't want to just have casual chat with him. So I say, hey, tell me a little bit about you. Well, I'm this. I'm a CEO. I'm this, 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 and this. Great. Right. Tell me what what's the one area if you attend. And he was wanting to attend my immersion. I was like, what's the area you'd want to change by if you attended the immersion? I don't need to convince him. I'm trying to find out with him. Right. Oh well, it's about the, in the area of romantic relationships. I struggle with that. Well, tell me what do you mean? What do you mean you struggle with that? Now I'm coaching him. I don't have to say let's have a powerful coaching conversation. I'm just coaching him. Right. Well, this has happened. This happened with my ex. Da 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 right? I'm now in the three principles world, they call this intake. I'm doing intake. I'm basically coaching someone. And by the way, you can do this even before you get on a call with someone. You can do this in the email. You can do this on messenger, right? A lot of people jump to setting up the call too soon without context, right? And by the way, this happens with women all the time. I remember coaching this lady years ago and she used to go to these networking events and she'd end up on dates by accident. She goes, oh, this guy thinks I'm trying to date him. No, it's weird. And I'm like, yeah, but you're creating that. You're not setting the context for this is a professional conversation, right? So what would happen is she'd go to this networking thing and she'd say to them, hey, would you like to grab tea? Do you like to grab coffee? Yeah, men, we're dumb. We'll misinterpret that, right? So guys would think, oh, yeah, like she's trying to hit on me. And then she'd say, oh, coach, like, I don't understand what's going on. I'm like, yeah, but there's no context. So we, I coached her around it. I'm like, right, you meet some guy at a networking event. Okay, he's an accountant. Ask him, hey, tell me about your accountancy firm. You don't need to flirt with him. You don't need to, that's not the way, like you're building a relationship. You say, How, how's the accountancy world? Oh, well, you know, it's this and that. Well, why, why are you here? Are you trying to grow your business? What, what, what brings you to this networking event? You're now coaching someone because you're there. You're asking questions. You're listening. That's coaching. Why are you at this networking event? What would you like to get out of it? Right. Well, the thing I'd really like to get out of it is I'd like to get more clients. Or do you know I've been working with a certain kind of client. I want a different kind of client. Well, what kind of client do you want? Right. Oh, then you ask the question, what's getting in the way of you having the clients you want? What's getting in the way of having the business? Now she starts asking these questions. Guess what? Her conversations are very different. Now they don't think she's asking them out on a date. Right. Context is everything. People get really clear when I speak to someone, they're really clear. And if they're not clear when they arrange the call, they're very clear very quickly when we're on the call. It doesn't happen very often now. But if I get on a call with someone and I had this years ago, someone got on a call and they said, let me just tell you up front, I'm not looking to hire a coach. I just need you to know that. And so I ask them, so I'm just curious, why are you on this call? Well, you know, I just like talking to coaches and I know you coaches do these kind of free discovery sessions and, you know, I just want to experience you. I went, great. We talked for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I said, are we complete? And this guy was shocked. He was settling into his armchair. He's waiting for an hour of free coaching. No, if the context is you just want to chat to me, I've got stuff to do. I don't want to just chat to people. I mean, I'm sure you're a nice person, but I've got my social life for that. I'll do that after hours, right? I'd rather do that with my friends than random people on the internet. So if the context is so important. And that's not, by the way, this is all loving. It's all service. It's not serving this guy if I'm giving him an hour of my time, which he doesn't appreciate. And he's not willing to pay for, right? Or at least consider paying for. And he, he was shocked. Uh, I'll do this now. I have so many people reach out to me from, hey, Ankush, I love your stuff. Can we catch up sometime? Can, can we chat? No. However, you'd like, now sometimes I might say, hey, however, I'm not really down for that. But if I can help you with something, why don't we have a, why don't we actually have a conversation that could be of service to you, whether we work together or not? Because that's me loving them, right? If I'm going to spend an hour with someone and they don't hire me, I'd rather spend an hour with them actually coaching them. That's going to help them. Why would I spend an hour with someone having a conversation, which is just this weird social conversation, which I used to do, by the way, a lot. And like, oh, now how do I transition this into making a proposal? Right. And it's like there's so many similarities with the dating world. Right. It's like now it's been a long time for me, maybe for you guys, too. Some of you, it's been a while since you were out in that dating world. But if you're single and you're meeting someone, right, be clear. I'm romantically interested in you. You don't want to just pretend to be someone's friend for a while and then go, oh, I hope that they like get the hint. That doesn't happen right? Set up the context. It's actually scarily similar how the kind of dating world and the coaching creation, client creation is so similar, right? Because it's it's basically relationship. It's a relationship business. So it's the same relationships everywhere, right? If you meet someone who's weird and creepy in a social situation, you don't want to hang around with them. Well, if you meet a weird, creepy coach, they don't want to get many clients. And unfortunately, there's some weird, creepy coaches. I'm um, sorry to say, we 
If you're laughing, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I've had people reach out to me on Facebook out of the blue, not anymore, but back in the day. Hey, would you like a powerful two-hour coaching conversation? I don't know you. What, what, what are you doing that for? Right? It's kind of weird. There's no context, right? It's like online, if someone, if you were single and you met some guy, like, hey, would you like to get married? It's too much, right? There's similarities. Well, we've got to get to know each other first. You seem nice. Is this making sense? I know it's making people laugh, but I hope it's helpful. Yeah, it was very helpful for me. Thank you. Yeah. We have Christina's hand up. Christina. I would love to go off of this because I think the context setting is really powerful when you know there is someone looking for a coach. I'm also in the process of filling my practice right now. And one of the things I've been doing is offering to serve a lot and just trying to be in as many conversations as I can. So I'm curious how, if at all, you see that different when you are offering to serve people who may not necessarily be looking for a coach. Oh, like no, no, it's not different at all. Not different at all. Now it's slightly different for me in terms of a lot of people who know me, know me in the context of the, when we have conversations, they're often looking for a coach. But for many, many years, that wasn't the case. And for the first few years of my business, no one was looking for a coach when we spoke. Like, I mean, literally no one. And so, you know, Steve Chandler would call it client creation. And I loved it. It wasn't client attraction. It wasn't client manifestation. It was client creation. I was creating clients. And in some ways I still do. Because even when people reach out to me, a lot of them, like my apprentices, like Moritz, well, you know, he's an apprentice of mine. I don't think most people, when they first talk to me, are thinking, hey, I want to do an apprenticeship with Ankush. Moritz, I'm guessing you weren't thinking that. Actually, no. The second time we, we went, we came. Second time, but the at the beginning, no. There's yeah. no context for it. Right. It's, it's people just think oh, it's a lot of money. But that's not what they're looking for. I create that through who I'm being and the context and what's possible and all the rest of it. Right. It's a created thing. So like I was on holiday last week. I speak to this guy. He's a doctor. And there's part of me thinking I could potentially create this guy as a client. Now, I'm full. I don't have space. And it was like, it was cool. It's hot. We're just chatting by the pool for a little bit. It's all good. But I could have potentially created this guy as a client. How do I do that? Hey, tell me a little bit about you. He was telling me a bit like, oh yeah, I'm in the NHS. I'm going to leave hospital work and become a GP. Why? It's too stressful. They don't pay you enough. He's giving me all his problems. Problems are great for me as a coach because then at a certain point, it's like, hey, do you want me to help you solve your problem? Would you like to have a conversation about your problems where I can help you with that? Is some version of what I need to say that's creating the context. And most people are going to say, no, I like my problems. Don't help me. Most people are going, yeah, sure. Go on then. If you've had a little bit of rapport, you don't need loads, right? So indiscriminate service, you know, without context is not very helpful. And you can create context. By the way, one thing we haven't talked about today is like, I love social media. I create context through social media. If anyone checks me out on Facebook or Instagram, it's really clear who I am and what I do. You check out my website. It's super clear, right? Super clear. So context is created. I'm creating that all the time. Now, I can meet someone out in the world who doesn't know anything about me, right? I'll give you an example. Today, my client Sachin, I took him to this guy who's, you know, 15 minute walk from my house and he's got the most unassuming business and I take clients there. Moritz, remind me, I'll take you the next time you come here, oh. right? And literally, it's not even got a proper board outside it. It's single glazed. It's got some shutters things on it and it's just called the watch shop, right? If you go on Google, it's got something like 3,000 five-star reviews or something ridiculous. It's in a, ter you know, all the houses are terrace houses of like a really rundown-ish area. Yeah, it's not posh. The guy's got amazing reviews. And I had a watch that needed fixing last year. So I check out this place. I was going to go into town. And for some reason, I go and check out this place. And the guy's like a hidden gem. He pulls out this book, right? And in this book, in the pages, in, in the slots, he's got like Rolexes. Not one. I mean, like he put out a bit with a hundred Rolexes. He goes, yeah, I'm just, he goes, all the jewelers from around the country send their Rolex. I, I service all the Rolexes, basically. And he's like walking to my house, right? And he goes, Breitlings, tags, but like all the posh watches he does, right? And he's probably really great to not get robbed because i think if people knew like the amount of value of stuff he's got in there he'd get burgled easily but it's just really unassuming little shop with like some really crappy clocks and stuff on the outside but this guy lives service right so i'm chatting to him and I, I love this guy i love what he does he starts telling me about the watch and how he does this and how he does that and he's telling me about his life i get to know the guy and by the way he tells me he makes over he tried to i think trying to get me to take over his business because he liked me so much he goes how much money do you make because i make i make a hundred thousand he wants to retire he goes ah oh, someone like you you could take over my business you could make more money and i said no thank you <laughs> i'm good and i wanted to create the context of who i am for him so Next time I go there, 
I take my book. I said, hey, do you, can I gift you my book? I've written, you guys written a book? Yeah, I got, if I give it to you, would you read it? He said, yeah, wow. Like, And I said, hey, here you go. Sachin actually, the second time I took him, I took my client Sachin. I was like, hey, I want you to introduce you to my client. I talk to people about business and I want him to show him your business because I think your business is fantastic. He goes on holiday and he's texting me like, wow, we're reading. Your, and I met his wife. His wife loves me. They're like, wow, this is so good. Now, I'm not trying to get this guy as a client, but I'm also not hiding who I am. The first event I did for coaches in 2016 was Steve Chandler in London with this two-day event. One of the themes that came out of the event was come out of the closet as a coach, right? So we've heard the saying, come out of the closet, right? It's like, come out of the closet as a coach. So many coaches, you're hiding who you are. You're hiding what you do. Why? Right. If you were a doctor, doctors don't go, oh, I'm a doctor, right? They let people know. Hey, is a doctor now? Yeah, me, I'm a doctor right? So I'm creating that context everywhere, right? Jackie Moses, I mean, you know, I took Jackie up there, we met this guy. I went and had a watch repair from him. I didn't actually need the watch repaired. I just took it there so I could take my client and show her what this guy does and who he is, right? And I mean, Steve Hardison does this with his neighbors. All his neighbors know kind of or have an inkling of what he does because he creates that. So you can be a brand, like you can change my name. You could move me across the world somewhere else as long as people can speak English, right? And I'll create my business again. You can get rid of all my social media. I'll, I'll, I'll create it again, right? Because the way of being, it's not like anything else. And I remember Steve Chandler said this years ago. He goes, oh, he said the same thing. He goes, in three months, I'll have this. I'll have a full practice. I was thinking, what? Really? It's true. I see it. Right. So please remember that. And like, don't th anything that, you know, I know you've had Steve on here, you've had rich habits, you got me, like, please don't think, oh, they're up here. So this works for them, but I'm starting out. So there's a different rule. No, no, we're telling you stuff because it works, right? Being really being of service, creating like all this stuff, because we do that, we are successful. It's not like we do that now. I had this client once and she was arguing me, literally, we're just arguing because I was telling her to like be of service. She goes, I want to create new clients. I went, great. Tell me about your existing clients. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, tell me about your existing clients because if we serve your existing clients, your business is going to grow. She didn't. We literally argued for the whole call. And she's like, no, 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 you don't understand, Ankush. I want more clients. She's talking to me like I'm mentally retarded or something, right? Like I need more clients. Why are you talking to me about existing? I was like, I, no, I get it. You want to grow your business? You want more clients? I get it. Let's talk about existing clients because that's going to help us create more clients. No, 40 minutes we went back and forth arguing, right? Then we had another call, same thing. And then she goes, look, Kush, this works for you, but you're making money. I need to make money. I need to grow my business. So let's talk about new clients. She didn't get it, right? And I had to tell her, no, it's you got it the wrong way. It's not like all of a sudden I've made money. So now I'm being generous and being of service to people. My business has grown because I'm being of service to people, right? And that being of service isn't indiscriminate. It's in context where I can help them. I can really help someone when they understand I'm a coach and I can have a conversation with them and have insights and discover new ways of being. Does that make yeah, sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I feel like for me... <laughs> This has been a theme over my last few months in general is like watching like extremes that I swing into. And I feel like I may have detached a bit too much from the outcome and there's power in bringing back invitation within those conversations. So that's really useful. Thank you. Yeah, most welcome. Ankush, I have a question because um, I've seen like one thing that I've seen with successful coaches is that they have in common apart from the service equation is really they've done some kind of service and really seeing that distinction for a while. So it's not the common way to be like, okay, in six months, I'm now hitting six figures and then multiple six figures because I got this thing. But it's way more what I've seen is it's way more the approach of a farmer who plants seeds all over. And there are other forces out there that water the plants. Your job is kind of just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Because what I found when we started working, I had some success in the beginning. And then there came a quiet phase before a lot of things started to happen again. And I've seen that over and over again in my life so far with the dance journey and all the other things. There are periods where the movement doesn't happen in the outside world and people get like scared of, oh shit, where's all the success now? But to really, really trust those principles, I think it, it also involves some time. What, what do you think about that? You know, I used to say that. I'm saying that a little bit less now, but there is there's still truth to it. The reason I'm saying it less now is like I've seen with my clients, like, dude, your success has been so, so fast. I mean, it's been unbelievably quick. So I'm starting to see it can take time and it doesn't have to, but yeah, it does. It does take some. 
And to me, it's like, I'll give you another example from my life. I'm on this kind of body transformation journey right now. I know you can all tell, wow, he looks so fit and healthy. I know that's what you're all thinking. And I've lost like, I don't know, about four kilos in the last month, something like that, which is a lot for me. And the first like two weeks, like I didn't lose anything. It was like really, really slow. And I was telling my kind of coach, my online coach that I have for it, I was like, man, this is really frustrating. I've been eating so healthy. I was eating 1500 calories a day. And I'm like, why is the weight not coming off? Right. And it, it come down a little bit, a little bit, but it wasn't. And he said, don't worry about it. And he started like, well, if you have an extra spoon of this and a bit of chocolate there. And, a, and I was like, I'm not having anything. I'm being really strict. Right. And I was getting really frustrated. And he goes, then in that case, don't worry, it'll come down. And that's exactly what happened, right? It just went down and down and down and down and down. So if I follow the system and the process that he set out for me, it's like I've got a certain way of eating, I've got a certain amount of calories I'm, I'm hitting, and I've got to make sure I'm getting enough protein and the right sort of food, right? I will lose weight, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm going through a cutting phase, right? Then there'll be a phase of building up again. And, but how do you do that effectively? He'll teach me and then I've got to work out. If I do that, I will get the results. Now, week to week, day to day, it might not be, you know, some days I'll go up, some days I'll go down. Like, it's going to be like that. Coaching is like this, right? But this is also why I think it's really important to have a coach. And ideally, like when I, I worked with Steve for six months, then I did six months. And every time I renewed with him after that, it was a year. And the reason was I knew there were times when I, my business would be up, sometimes it'd be down. And sometimes when it was up, I'm like, oh, I don't need Steve, right? And when it's down, if I needed to renew, then I'd get scared. Oh, I'm going to renew now and my business has gone. So I was like, I want, I want to sign up for a year at a time because, and he wasn't pushing me on that. He said, oh, this is the price for six months. I didn't say, can I have a discount? I I said, can I pay you double and sign up for a year? And he went, yeah. He goes, because it's your benefit. And I got it. Because then when I'm signed up for a year with him, it's like, he's going to take me through and guide me through that process so that when I have a wobble, and it happened the first year I worked with Steve, I remember I signed up like three or four clients in a week. And I'm like, yeah, I've made it. Like, that's it. Like, woohoo, right? Here come the like, I'm a millionaire, right? And then I went through like six weeks of, oh, I had leprosy and like, no one wanted to touch me. No one wanted to like sign up with me. I couldn't, I couldn't get a client for love nor money. And Steve just like guided me through that process, right? Like, no, stick, stick to what we're talking about. Just serve, just serve, like stick to it. And I was getting in my own way, but I stuck to it, stuck to it. It stuck to it and then I got a big client and then it was like it was back. So yes, it can take time. Yes, it's a process. It can be quick. But I think for me, it's like well, I saw something on Instagram recently, which is when the best entrepreneurs, the business, and this is businesses in general, is like they implement, okay. implement, 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 take action, 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 action. The thing is, if you you need to have that mindset, but then also if you have the right system to help, like, and this is what I've done with my body transformation. I found something. I think these guys know what they're talking about. They've got lots of case studies of people who've done this. I had a conversation with them. All I need to do now, now I've got this, they've given me what to do. I just need to implement. That's it. Right. The, one of the challenges in our coaching industry is people are being told the wrong stuff. You need a funnel. You need an email list. You need to do this, that, and the other it doesn't work. But if you get the right system, then you can just go full on implementation mode. And then it might happen quick. It might happen slow. But if you stay on the path long enough, and I always had this thing, I'm in this for the long term. And I was like, I'm not even going to judge my success until I'm 10 years in. Right. And if I had like a year that didn't go quite so well, I'm like, oh, I'm only in year four. Don't judge this profession until 10 years. Stay on the path, stay on the path, stay on the path. 10 years in. Yeah, it's like flying. Amazing. Ankush, thank you so much for all the gold you shared. I only saw smiling faces and nodding heads. And if I didn't see them, they were down to take some notes. So I'm just I'm just taking a stand for saying that was really, really amazing. A lot of value that you brought to this conversation. So thank you so much for modeling over delivery. Anything you want to say at the end, like people who want to know more, I think everyone on the call actually knows where to find Ankush and reads your posts. So anything else you want to say about that? No, not at all. Like I'm on Facebook, guys. You can connect with me there if you feel like it. And just thank you for inviting me into this program that you guys are doing. I hope you don't just hear it as information. Really do test it. If there's something I said that you don't agree with, test it. You know, that's the best thing to do. So I encourage you guys to do that. And I just want to say you've got a fabulous guy leading this program in Moritz. I have so much love for you. And the way that this man shows up to our coaching is really a testament to what a great client is. So, you know, he is the real deal. I don't do a lot of these. I, I get asked to do these and I pretty much say no to most of them, but I'm really happy to do this for you, Moritz. And I know that anyone that attends your program and attends this and listens to you and implements what you're sharing, you know, will just really fly. I know if I attended this program as a client, I'd grow my business, you know, just really want to acknowledge you and everyone in this group. Thank you so much, Ankush. Thank you everyone for the great questions. Thank you, Ankush. Take care. Bye everyone.
Thank, Thank you. you. Kush, kush, bye.